My name is Dr. Arnie Bsejo, and I am a Mayo Foundation Scholar um, of Neuroanesthesiology and an Assistant Professor of Anesthesiology and Perioperative Medicine at the Mayo Clinic. Hi, I'm Dr. Jeff Pasternak. I'm an Associate Professor of Anesthesiology and Perioperative Medicine also at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. We are going to discuss a study that we conducted that is being published in the July 2017 issue of the Mayo Clinic Proceedings, entitled Exposure to Surgery and Anesthesia after concussion due to mild traumatic brain injury. Concussion is a functional manifestation of mild traumatic brain injury. Although gross structural changes in, may not be evident on CT or MRI, microscopic and metabolic changes occur in the brain after concussion, contributing to what is now known as post-concussive syndrome. The injured brain can be especially vulnerable to further insults and additional injury can compound these changes. Therefore, following any sort of brain injury, Optimization of brain homeostasis is of paramount importance. Patients who have suffered a concussion may have other associated injuries that could disrupt homeostasis, such as abdominal injuries or long bone fractures. Additionally, surgery and anesthesia, whether it be to treat associated injuries or to facilitate diagnostic procedures, can also disrupt homeostasis. Specifically, in the perianesthetic period, patients receive medications that can affect cerebral hemodynamics. Patients are also at risk for changes in blood pressure, arterial carbon dioxide and oxygen tension, and serum glucose concentration, all factors that could potentially modulate outcome following traumatic brain injury. Therefore, the perioperative period represents a potential time to modulate outcome following mild traumatic brain injury as encountered in patients who have suffered a concussion. This retrospective study aimed to characterize patients who suffered a mild traumatic brain injury or concussion and then subsequently received an anesthetic within one year of that injury. To accomplish this, we identified all patients who received care at Mayo Clinic in Rochester who were diagnosed with a concussion via the International Classification of Diseases 9 and 10 codes between the dates of July 1, 2005 and June 30, 2015. Patients in this cohort who had an electronic anesthetic record generated within one year after their concussion diagnosis date were then identified. All electronic medical records were then manually reviewed to verify the date of the injury that produced the concussion as well as the date of the concussion diagnosis. We excluded any patient with one, a clinical history inconsistent with the Mayo Traumatic Brain Injury Classification System Diagnostic Criteria for a definite, probable, or possible mild traumatic brain injury, two, a Glasgow Coma Scale less than 13 after resuscitation, three, any penetrating head injury, or four, any traumatic carotid or vertebral artery injury. We then categorize the type of injury and the type of surgical or diagnostic procedure each patient underwent. The mechanism of injury that resulted in concussion was classified as either due to a motor vehicle accident, a sports-related event, a fall, or an assault. From July 1st, 2005 through June 30th, 2015, 1,038 patients underwent 1,820 procedures involving anesthesia within a year of a clinically diagnosed concussion or mild traumatic brain injury. Those who experienced a sports-related concussion were younger, and those who experienced a fall-related concussion were older than the other groups. Concussed patients were predominantly male, except those who had a concussion related to a fall. Patients who experienced a concussion during a motor vehicle accident were more likely to be admitted to the hospital whereas patients who suffered a sports-related injury were more likely to be treated in the outpatient setting. However, diagnosis of concussion was most likely to be delayed in patients who suffered a sports-related injury. The delay was due to either mild symptoms or symptoms that were failed to resolve. Patients who suffered a fall or sports-related concussion underwent surgical procedures that were unrelated to their injury within one week of that injury at a higher rate than patients who sustained a motor vehicle accident. The highest number of procedures and anesthetics performed per, per patient occurred in those patients who sustained a concussion due to motor vehicle accident. The diagnosis of concussion due to sports, falls, or assaults increased over the study period, whereas rates of concussion due to motor vehicle accidents remained static through this period. Lastly, we identified 29 anesthetics that were performed in nine different patients after, after an injury before the di diagnosis of concussion. All the patients in this group sustained a concussion due to a mo motor vehicle accident. Concussion in this cohort was diagnosed due to persistent symptoms 
characteristic of post-concussive sy syndrome? We found that surgical and diagnostic procedures requiring anesthesia were common in patients who had sustained a concussion with the highest rates occurring shortly after their injury. 7% of patients with a concussion had a delay in diagnosis of more than one week after their injury. Furthermore, many patients underwent surgical and diagnostic procedures requiring anesthesia within one week of their injury that were considered to be elective and unrelated to their concussion injury. It is important not to understate the physiologic impact of brain concussion. Several hemodynamic and metabolic changes occur after a concussion that potentially make the brain more vulnerable to secondary injury. For example, global cerebral blood flow decreases in most patients after concussion and can persist for weeks or even months. This is especially seen in patients who exhibit post-concussive symptoms such as headache, nausea, lethargy, or memory difficulty. Other changes include impaired cerebral blood flow autoregulation and changes in cerebral metabolism. The data we provide offers several insights into surgical and anesthetic utilization in patients with concussion. First, surgery and general anesthesia are most commonly required in the acute phase after injury, a time when the brain may be most vulnerable to a secondary injury. Several patients were found to undergo elective and unrelated procedures requiring anesthesia during their first week after injury. These were mostly molar tooth extractions, cataract surgery, and other unrelated orthopedic procedures. Some patients underwent surgical procedures after traumatic injury occurred, but before the diagnosis of concussion was made. This, was, this usually occurred in the presence of other more distracting injuries or in the presence of post-concussive post symptoms. We noted a significant increase in the annual number of non-motor vehicle accident related concussions beginning in the period between 2010 and 2011. This is probably unlikely due to an increase in the number of concussions, but instead more likely due to the increase in the awareness of concussion. In 2009, the National Football League issued a statement that sports related concussions can have long lasting adverse effects on the brain. And in 2010, the American Association of Pediatrics and the American Academy of Neurology recommended that young athletes who experience a sports-related concussion receive physician clearance before returning to sports activities. This investigation had multiple limitations. Given its retrospective nature, many concussions were likely not recorded and may not have been identified. In addition, patients may have sustained a concussion but did not seek medical care and their for their injury but subsequently required surgery and anesthesia. Also, patients with moderate or severe traumatic brain injury may also have received a diagnosis of concussion. The study also involved only patients who were cared for at a single major academic medical center based in Rochester, Minnesota. This medical practice reflects a referral base from the surrounding smaller towns and rural areas, thus these data may not reflect other environments. Also, there may have been bias in the judgment of the investigators regarding the urgency of surgeries and the relevance of surgery to the primary injury. Based on this data, we would recommend the following. First and foremost, clinicians should have increased awareness for concussions in patients who sustain a trauma, even those for whom no formal diagnosis of concussion was made. Furthermore, clinicians may consider delaying elective surgical and diagnostic procedures after concussion. Although a defined endpoint does not exist, it seems reasonable to delay these procedures at least until post-concussive symptoms have completely resolved. For more information about this investigation, we refer you to the July 2017 issue of the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Thank you. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our home page is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.